Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, actually. Sorry, I'm working at a different clock, aren't I? <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, uh, as I said, my name is Mohammed Mamdani, and I'm the director of a charity called Sufra in Northwest London, uh, which is basically a community food bank and kitchen based in the London borough of Brent. Uh, we are a new organization. Um, next month will be our second anniversary. However, I have worked in the Muslim voluntary sector for the last 14 years. Um, I started after my A-levels, uh, months after September the 11th. Um, and it's been a journey for me. Um, when I look at the Muslim voluntary sector, I think the last 14 years um, have been a journey for the Muslim community in its attempt to define itself as British, as Muslim, and find a community space that is safe for it to um, promote its values uh, and also identify itself as part of the fabric of British society. And for me, that has also been a personal journey. Um, and I will briefly discuss sort of what's happened in the Muslim voluntary sector later on. Uh, but first of all, I suppose I should say a bit about Sufra Northwest London. Uh, the very first question that people of, often ask me is, what does Sufra mean? Um, the word Sufra actually comes from the Persian, uh, which uh, has a rather poetic definition of that on which provisions are placed. Um, in Turkish, it's just simply a tablecloth. Um, uh, in Arabic, in Egyptian Arabic, uh, the word sufra tends to refer to the dining room within a household. Um, and certainly within the Indian subcontinent, um, within several Asian languages, uh, the word sufra is normally defined as a gathering at which food is served, normally sitting on the ground where you have sort of long um, sort of paper tablecloths um, where, where food is served uh, to the community. And the word essentially carries strong um, connotations of generosity, of openness, of compassion, um, of hospitality. And that is a core ethos of our work uh, at Sufra Northwest London. So the services that we provide obviously revolve around the food bank um, and in many ways it follows the proliferation of food banks across the country um, and uh, that is the core area of our work. Last year we collected and distributed about 46 tons of food uh, serving about 3,400 people. So it's not a small operation um, but that's also because Brent never really had a strong similar service there. Um, so there is no competition if you want to see it that way in, in our work. Um, I think what is interesting about food banks is that not only are the individuals and families who present themselves to the food bank uh, people who've fallen through the gaps in the welfare system, but in some ways they have also fallen through the gaps in the voluntary sector. Because let's remember that the vast majority of our referral agencies are actually charities in the community. So the people that come to our door not only feel that they have been let down by sort of mainstream provision, but that they have you know, they've accessed the voluntary sector and that's all that, can, that they can be provided with. And they turn up at our door and for many of them it is the last point of call. But I wouldn't be working in a food bank if that's all that we were doing. We're not naive. A food bank only plasters across a problem. It can only provide immediate relief to someone's need. And it doesn't respond in any way to the underlying issues around food poverty or poverty more generally. And whilst the people who present themselves feel that they're at the end of their tethers, at the end of a journey, for me it's the first point of call, where it's not just about providing food, but about reintegrating them into mainstream services, providing new avenues whereby they can find the help that they need to respond to those underlying issues that put them into a position whereby they access a food bank. And so what you see Sufra emerging as is a whole mosaic of different services trying to achieve different social outcomes um, that respond to these underlying reasons for people coming to the food bank. The very first service that we developed um, was a food academy, training young people in cookery skills, very much inspired by the life experiences of people who come to the food bank. 
And it was actually the very first person who came to the food bank, an 18-year-old boy called Stephen who had just left care, um, who presented himself at the food bank and we offered him his food parcel and he looked at it and said, I don't know what to do with this. And the real issue was that as someone who had been brought up in care without the stable family background um, that, that, that most other people will benefit from, um, basic life skills is where he struggled. Money management. So he'd worked out that he had about 10 to 15 pounds per week to spend on food. Now that's hardly very much. But when that 10 to 15 pounds has to be spent on buying takeaways, uh, ready meals, it doesn't stretch very far at all. So the Food Academy was designed with Stephen's story in mind, but opened up to any young person who was moving into independent accommodation, as well as more, you know, as well as any young person who, 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 who felt they could benefit from the course. And it happens over 10 sessions where we have a professional chef that comes in, they learn a range of dishes, and it's part of an accredited qualification as well. So it's about the wider social outcomes. Two of the young people who just passed through the program we had about 25 young people who have completed the Food Academy since September last year um, have actually found jobs in the catering and hospitality industry. And it's that journey that is so vital and influences us in the way in which we design new services. So, for example, in April we're launching a vegetable box scheme, trying to change the economy for uh, local people who find it difficult to buy fresh produce, essentially allowing them to purchase fruit and veg at, ho at wholesale prices. Um, we're setting up a food growing project on the estate where, where, where we're based. We actually have a business enterprise project running at the moment in partnership with Aston University, training individuals who want to set up their own enterprise in how to get started and how to, and how to, um, and how to set up the infrastructure um, of their own business. Uh, we should also be launching taster courses uh, for adults in different vocations um, so that we can try and get people back into employment. So it's this holistic vision that is so fundamental to what we do. Um, I think so far um, the work that has taken place within the food bank sector um, has essentially focused on that immediate need, which is absolutely essential. No one's questioning that food banks are not needed. Um, what it is, however, is that we need to now make that evolution. We need to make that journey, recognizing that a food bank is not about a transactional process. It's not about handing over a voucher and receiving a food parcel and maybe getting a little bit of emotional support. It's about more than that. It's about adding depth um, uh, and, 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 and long-term ambitions to each and every individual who turns up at the food bank. Obviously, our relationship with the Muslim community is quite special. About 50% of our funds and resources come from the Muslim community. Um, and that relationship is very, very significant. Um, and often we're referred to as a Muslim organization or a faith-based organization. And I'm not quite sure I know exactly what that means. Um, but we can discuss that a bit, more, a bit later on. But I think it's also important to recognize that we are just as dependent on other faith communities in the area. We have a great relationship with the lo local Catholic Church that regularly holds food collections. Um, you know, we have a great relationship with uh, the local Jewish community who also organize their own activities to support our work. And our volunteer work workforce as well is made up of people of different faith and no faith background. And that is essentially, you know, the, the spirit by which we work and that makes the work that we do so special. I have, as I, as I mentioned, worked in the Muslim voluntary sector and it's interesting to see what's changed over the last sort of 14 years. Um, in many ways, until, until very recently, it almost stood as a standalone sector um, where the focus of many Muslim charities was to provide services that meet the faith and cultural sensitivities of its own community. Um, when I, you know, as in the vast majority of the Muslim community um, is essentially an immigrant community, a migrant community. Uh, my father came to this country in the early 70s and when I look at his charitable activities and his voluntary work and where he donates, um, generally speaking he will choose to donate to causes um, that are international. Um, he will support 
um, sanitation projects in East Africa, um, or he will be interested in education in our ancestral homes in India. And of course, with the solidarity that exists within Muslim communities across the, the, the Muslim world, naturally, wherever there are disasters, wherever there is war, wherever there is famine, a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of the focus of my father, and indeed the wider adult Muslim community, will be to support those causes. But over time, we've seen that the Muslim community during this period has learned to recognize that charity doesn't essentially begin at home, has looked back at its own tradition and recognized this value. But also, the, demogra the demography of the Muslim community is radically changing as well. About 70% of the Muslim community is under the age of 30 years. Okay? We are generally British born. We have a strong affinity to, 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 to our identity as citizens of this country. And naturally, when we look to support one another, we have you know, a sense of responsibility and duty to our local communities. And I think this has probably created um, a dramatic change in the way in which the Muslim community now takes part in charitable activities. In many ways, actually, the large international Muslim charities like Islamic Relief, like Muslim Aid, actually feel quite threatened at this moment in time. Because traditionally, all our funds as a community, and the Muslim community is very, very generous, has gone towards these international causes. And now, things are changing. Local projects are emerging across the whole of the UK, where Muslims are trying to now focus on the needs of their local communities. And this change has been, well, in some ways quite, quite quick. 14 years is not a very long time. <clears throat> But what you now see is that whilst the debate used to take the debate that used to take place of is there poverty in the UK because the mentality of the Muslim community was to look in relative terms to their homelands towards you know international the international sphere now we're speaking about poverty in the UK we're recognizing the issues in our local communities and we want to invest in the local community however I think in some ways we need, to, we need to understand what this actually means. Because as the Muslim community begins to take part in local projects, it is interesting to see how the wider community reflects on this and how it is perceived. You see, if a church were to set up a homeless project, no one would ask any questions. But if a mosque were to open up a homeless project, suddenly loads of questions would appear. I've been asked some very unusual questions along the way. So, you must be religiously biased, I was once told by a shopper outside Sainsbury's when I, asked, when I was giving out shopping lists to, to, to ask for food donations. Um, where are strange questions like, will you turn away people who are drunk? What if a prostitute were to come to your service? What do you think about homosexuality? As if any of these questions really matter to me in any way. One of our referral agencies is an LGBT organization that does refer people um, you know, of a different sexual orientation to the service. It makes no difference to me, but it seems to make a difference to everyone else. I know that for the first year of my time at Sufra, and this is in some ways a waste of charitable resources, I spent most of my time answering these questions, lobbying people in order to become a service that is able to integrate with local provision. It's been a challenge, but that question will always exist, it seems. And I think now it is important for the wider community to recognize that the Muslim community also has a role, a positive role to play in the community. And we need to start breaking down a lot of the prejudice that is associated with those Muslims who do want to play a significant role in, in the local community. I do not want to spend most of my try, time trying to prove to people that we're, we're an equal opportunities provider. I don't want to have to justify at every step of the way how our work is you know, just the same as anyone else's work. And I think this is going to be the challenge, I think, for the Muslim community over the next few years, as it still tries to prove itself to the mainstream community. The truth is, is that faith communities do play a very important role in welfare provision, 
particularly as we see the sector changing all around, of, uh, all around us. We're in a very difficult and different economic climate. When I look at the London Borough of Brent, the number of charities and community organisations that have closed down is, is, is just incomprehensible. And what you see now emerging is this division between the very large corporate charities and the one-man bands of noble individuals who want to do something to change their community. There is nothing in between at the moment. We have those charities that are delivering contracts on behalf of local government that will never think twice about having to fundraise for its services. And then you have those individual ambassadors in the community who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. But we've also seen some really interesting things emerge. Um, we find ourselves in a position where we're now starting to recreate those services in much the same way that when Stephen presents himself at the food bank, we designed a food academy to deal with a particular need in the community. I came across a local Somali organization. Traditionally, our, you know, our, our stereotype is that you know, a Somali organization will only help people from a Somali background. But actually, they've become the de facto refugee forum, migrant refugee forum, and we're actually supporting a whole range of individuals who do not, or who are not part of the, the Somali community. And that's actually something quite special. As a community, they too are becoming more integrated. They too understand the notion of public service and of breaking down the barriers that previously had limited the way in which services functioned. We're also seeing the council now engaging with the voluntary sector in a way that it never has done before. So when the housing department turns up to Sufra and starts training our volunteers on how to deal with housing provision. That's something that certainly in Brent we've never seen before. It's something that is quite radical. And what we're seeing is that the traditional barriers um, between public sector services and voluntary sector services are now changing. And those lines are becoming blurred. However, at a time when faith communities are beginning to fill that gap, it is also a time where we should be asking what we mean by faith-based organizations. What does it mean to be part of a faith community and to deliver welfare services from within that community? Wonderful things are happening when faith communities are taking on the baton and beginning to fill that gap in social provision. Within the Muslim community, we talk about radicalized Muslim youth, but we don't talk about those young Muslims who are so active. I have volunteers, well, 40% of my volunteers are under the age of 19 years. They're the ones who are hauling crates of sugar from our storage facility into the food bank. They're the ones who are the service. We are utterly reliant on them. And they bring their friends along who are not part of the, of the Muslim community. And we suddenly see a whole spectrum of faith communities working together. There is a, the debate that really hasn't taken place so far as to what influence faith has on our service provision. Are faith-based services better? Are they worse? Or is there no difference at all? Does it have a role to play at all? Certainly when I look to myself, because in many ways this is also, as I said, a personal journey. Um, I work in, in, in a charity that has significant relationships with the Muslim community. But ultimately, my personal motivation is solely humanitarian. Yes, no doubt that my faith has had um, an influence on my ethics and my values and how I put those into action. But the work that I do is solely about the individual who presents himself or herself to me. But I don't know if that's the same across faith communities. And there is a significant danger that actually, whilst the contributions of faith communities are being grabbed by the welfare state, some of the important questions are remaining unchecked. We come across organizations that blur the line between service provision and an underlying missionary agenda. And I think that is quite dangerous. 
we know food banks that essentially will exchange food for faith. But no one talks about that because it's a dangerous subject. Because we don't want to lose those services. But it is something that is so common within the faith-based sector, especially at a time when no one is asking those difficult questions. From my perspective, actually the faith-based community organizations are in a situation that is quite dangerous, where sometimes religious motivations overstep the boundaries and a creeping agenda of missionary work begins to take over. My priority as an individual and as the director of SUFRA is to try and develop an organization that builds its capacity in creating an interfaith workforce. See, I grew up in, in, at a time when interfaith work was essentially debates, dialogue, handshaking ceremonies, um, you know, very elitist, had nothing to do with the grassroots of the community. I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in seeing people of different faith backgrounds and those of no faith take part in social action together. I look forward to seeing people of faith and no faith working together, fundraising together, sharing resources together to create a common purpose and vision that is sustainable. Faith-based organizations that are actually interfaith-based organizations. And it is at that point that we can talk about a united and cohesive community. Thank you very much.